In 1889, Copper King W.A. Clark and 74 other men wrote a state constitution to serve the needs of Montana's powerful interests with a weak governor, a secretive legislature, and special tax deals for the powerful. After 60 years under the copper collar, Montana was declared the nearest thing to a colony of any American state. The Anaconda Mining Company even owned most Montana newspapers, the Copper Press. The corporate dominance of Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. Seventy years after statehood, the Copper Press was finally sold and thousands of World War II veterans had been educated under the GI Bill. Newly enlightened Montanans wanted out from under the copper collar, and big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Changing Montana's constitution was the top priority. Strengthening the governorship, opening up the legislature, empowering citizens. Voices of Montana women, totally silenced in 1889, rang out loud and clear for these changes. When the Constitutional Convention began, 19 women were among the elected delegates. And when the delegates came together in convention, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, men and women, young and old, sat alphabetically as equals, Montanans just wanting to make their state better. And so they did, producing a Constitution for the ages, the last best constitution. Now at its 50th anniversary, Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time shine a light on the creation of this remarkable Montana constitution. Welcome back to Last Best Constitution. Uh, this series of programs uh, is filled with episodes about the development of the Montana constitution 50 years ago. We're at the 50th anniversary of the creation of Montana's 1972 Constitution. We celebrated that 50th anniversary in June with uh, wonderful ceremonies and panels and information uh, at the state capitol in the House Chambers, which was known as the Convention Hall to the delegates. Uh, during this 1972 convention, 100 delegates came from across Montana. They were citizen delegates. They could not be office holders. They couldn't be members of the legislature or city council members or any other civil office at the time. So those hundred people came together as citizens, sat alphabetically rather than by party so that they could work uh, together as, uh, as citizens of the state trying to find out that was best for the state. Uh, there was uh, much going on in that constitutional convention uh, and it emerged from uh, 83 years of Montana living uh, under what we refer to as the copper collar. The 1889 constitution that happened when we were, became a state uh, was written by the powerful interests of Montana, predominantly the Anaconda Company and their associates, uh, by the powerful interests for the powerful interests. And so uh, uh, Montana uh, really suffered under, again, what was called the copper collar for 83 years. Uh, Montanans were chafing under that in the, as the 50s and the 60s were evolving, as the women's movement was coming forth, as the environmental movement was coming forth, as people got educated under the GI Bill and became, and there was an enlightened new Montana uh, that was emerging at the time. and the change needed in Montana was seen to be predominantly the change in the Constitution. Now one thing that wasn't at the Constitutional Convention, there were no delegates among those 100 who were Native American. There were no Indian delegates. Uh, that was not unusual because the history of Montana is that uh, the Indians of Montana uh, uh, suffered discrimination and oppression from the beginning of Montana. And uh, they played very little role in Montana government up to that point. And so the, the Constitution itself uh, is a dividing line, if you will, uh, a, a point where uh, uh, Indians came forth and asked for some recognition and for involvement in our government. And that is what we're going to take up today. 
Uh, we have, uh, it's a very special program, and we have uh, two special guests with us today. Uh, first, Mike Jetty. Uh, Mike is, uh, uh, the, I met Mike at our 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, you and Shane Doyle, I believe, came mm -hmm. forward and sang an honor song, a Native American on, <laughs> honor song, before uh, one of the, the uh, on the first day of the event. Uh, and I uh, would appreciate getting to know you then. And you are uh, one of the key employees, one of the key developers and uh, operators right now under what we call Indian Education for All. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more, but tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mike Jetty. I'm a member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Anishinaabe descendant. And I've been working with uh, Indian Education since 1991. Started out as a classroom teacher on the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota, and I taught, uh, I was their education department there. I taught uh, five grade levels, uh, history government, tribal government, a Lakota studies class, and uh, when I was going to, when I was teaching school there, I heard about a graduate program at Montana State, and that's how I uh, migrated over to Montana 28 <coughs> years ago, and I've uh, been here ever since, uh, mainly working on Indian education for all now. Uh, doing curriculum and professional development at, at OPI. Well, so, that's uh, great. Well, thank you for thank you for joining us. And our, our other guest is Anna Whiting Sorrell. And Anna and, and I have been uh, uh, compatriots for now 18 years. You realize that it was 18 years ago in November and December of 20, 2004, 18 years ago, that we first met uh, doing the transition for Governor Brian Schweitzer, who was newly elected, and we were putting together the new administration, or for him mm -hmm. to put, and, 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 I, and I said, who's that smart lady there? That, that was you. <laughs> You know, and so uh, and 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 you, of course, uh, became part of the administration, uh, and we've worked together ever since. And you were at first the uh, a coordinator for uh, health. Was it? A I was a policy advisor policy? for health and families um, within the governor's okay. uh, so inner you, circle. And so you were the policy advisor for the governor on that mm -hmm. important thing. Like we had a we had a policy advisor for natural resource mm -hmm. stuff, and you were more on the the human side. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you went from there to do a lot of wonderful things, including I believe you were the well, surely in Montana the first Native American department director ever confirmed by the Montana Senate. And I believe you may have been the first department director of a health department uh, of any state in the nation mm -hmm. when you were named there by Governor Schweitzer. Yes, I was. But tell us more about your background, which is varied and interesting. So I would add to your piece where you started about um, the activism of the 1970s. Um, and there was certainly this activism around um, um, American Indians. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a time of great activism across the country for American Indians in the 70s with the American Indian Movement, with the takeover of Alcatraz and the Trail of Broken <laughs> Treaties right. at that time. And, and so I really do think the foundation of people coming together for the convention, you know, the, the indigenous people that came, it was really a result of a lot of work that had been done to really raise mm -hmm. the profile of American Indians in Montana. Um, and I was raised by a mother that was very much a part of that activism. And so um, I too was a school teacher. I taught at Two Eagle Rivers School for uh, right after I graduated with my degree from um, in, uh, from the University of Montana, um, taught for three years, much like, like Mike, where I taught tribal government, tribal history, and, and looked for indigenous material to work into the um, curriculum. I then went and got my degree, a uh, master's degree in public administration, and spent a, a significant amount of time. I ran our tribe substance abuse program, and then took over um, doing a lot of work around self-determination, contracting, and compacting, which led me at some point to move on to, to working for Senator John Kerry's presidential campaign at a national level. When Senator Kerry um, wasn't elected, um, Brian Schweitzer was elected governor that night, the first time in 20 years that there would be a transition to a Democratic governor, and he asked me to be a part of his team. 
Um, and as you said, you know, I was the health and family policy advisor, went on to be the first Native American um, person um, confirmed by the um, Montana Senate to be the Department of Public Health and Human Services. Which director. is the largest state department it, by a long shot. It is the largest state department with lots of employees on every main street in Montana. Um, when when Senator, when um, Brian, when Governor Schweitzer, excuse me, um, when he was termed, I then went and was um, Conf was a, se a senior executive service executive for the federal government as the Billings Area Indian Health Service Director, and um, and then eventually returned to my tribe. And now, I am um, I, I work for Kaufman and Associates, an Indian-owned company, an Indian woman-owned company that does work that matters all across the country. And I am a new PhD student at the Montana State University in indigenous and rural health. And so you never quit learning. Never you know? do. <laughs> and, never and, do, uh, no. Well, you've had such a marvelous and diverse uh, career. And uh, it, uh, it's interesting, uh, the, when we look at the situation, and you're right, I should have mentioned that, when you speak of the activism that was evolving mm -hmm. at that time, certainly Indian activism was happening. And we were, uh, 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 but it, it did not result in anybody coming to the Constitutional Convention because the way that they were elected, uh, they were elected in the same districts as the legislature. And back mm -hmm. in those days, they didn't have this, what we have now called single member districts, where if you live in a, uh, there's, there's one candidate for a given area, or one uh, legislator for that area, and every, you, everybody has to file for that one. So if you were, if you were coming out of Great Falls, and there's a, a significant Native American population <coughs> in Great Falls, urban, uh, you've got, uh, uh, they they used to elect 12 mm. out of Great Falls. Wow. And so a voter had to choose between 24 people and select 12. And so with all that, mm. the, the way it was, it was harder for, for Indians to get, uh, uh, be singled out to have a, an area where, uh, where their uh, reservation might be and where there's a, a predominance of, of, of Indians who can elect representation for themselves. It wasn't that way. Uh, so, so, lo and behold. I might add that, that I've talked to you about, certainly, Evan, is that I was also a representative at the Youth Con Con. So the um, YMCA yeah. uh, had a Youth Con Con following that, and our, one of our advisors was May Nan Ellingson. Oh, and uh -huh. so, you know, we came, we did the same thing and um, that, the, you, that the, the adults had done, but we did that as, as youth involved in government. And May Nan, you know, was the, what, I like what she says. She says, I'm still the youngest delegate. <laughs> oh, okay, she still is, yeah. And, Except for all those youth that yeah, came together. Yeah, you know, and, uh, yeah. uh, and in fact, uh, there's a lot of activity still going on relative to our Constitution that as we celebrate the 50th, um, uh, May Nan is the chairman of an organization called Friends of the Montana Constitution, mm -hmm. and I'm vice chairman of that. And uh, the idea is we want to open up uh, an organization so as many Montanans who want to participate as friends of the Constitution have the opportunity to do so because it used to be the society was only the hundred delegates oh. well, there's only ten left now oh. and so uh, 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 we're opening the doors of that to the citizens of Montana in the same way that Brian Schweitzer opened the doors of Montana government to, to Indian country there was no question that happened uh, and Indian education for all has become the, uh, emerged out of the Constitution and it came out of the, uh, uh, the way they, they found a place to write some concern for Native Americans and their culture in Montana. Uh, and it came up in the Indian, in the education article. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little bit about how that got in there. As you, based, you've done a lot of research on mm -hmm. this, and it's your life. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. 
Sure, uh, you know, Montana, we are the only state that has it written into our state constitution that will teach about American Indians, and that to me is very powerful. And so we have a, a constitutional foundation for all the work that we do at OPI. Uh, it says the state recognizes the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indians and is committed in its educational goals to the preservation of their cultural integrity. And that constitutional language is so powerful. Um, and then, you know, Earl Barlow, a Blackfeet educator, played a, a huge role in getting people there to, uh, you know, be at the convention and testify. Um, I mentioned there's a website called uh, MontanaTribes.org we were visiting earlier, and I, I shared that link to uh, Earl Barlow's videos where he, he describes that, you know, advocacy kind of behind the scenes work in making sure at least. He was some quite, of, he was a young educator at that time, yeah. a young man. Yeah, he was and like the Indian Ed Department at OPI, he was just like one person, yeah. you know, working on all these issues. But um, his kind of behind the scenes work, you know, helping to, you know, get Indian people at least a, a foot in the door, you know, to have folks come I think testify. he reached out, didn't he? He reached out to the, and said, come on in here. We need people to come in here and <laughs> testify and talk about it. And it was an awkward situation, actually. Yeah, and then I wrote a little lesson plan for Indian Ed for All about that, but quoting the delegates. And I think it was Delegate Champeau was talking about, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Indians are waiting at the door. You know, are you going to answer them? And, you know, some of that powerful language that came out of those testimonies, that discussion, I think um, it really um, laid the foundation for all our work. And since then, you know, there's been Indian educators and educational leaders that have come together to say, how do we make this a reality now? But um, thank God for those 100 na non-native delegates to having that vision, you know, to listen to the, to the native community out that weren't an official part of the process, but to hear their testimony and to take it to heart. And I think it fits in with what Anna was talking about, you know, the, the historical context. And there was a lot of progressive stuff happening in our country in regards to civil rights and, um, you know, Native Americans, you know, I guess being given a voice, but, uh, you know, having that affirmed in our Constitution and saying, hey, there is a place for you at the table in our educational system. Well, first, I think the, uh, the, the fact that it ended up in the education article is an interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, when, you, when you mentioned that, it, that there were 100 uh, non-Indians putting uh, this language into the Constitution reminds me of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, our situation w when our... Uh, our first woman congressman from Montana, Jeanette Rankin, uh, was elected. Uh, but before she was elected, uh, Montana passed women's right to vote. It was passed nationally after she was elected, but Montana passed women's right to vote. But she made a point of saying it took, it was the men of Montana voted to give women the right to vote because women didn't have it. They were just outside looking in. Now, it was pretty tight, actually. <laughs> and unlike the vote, because I think when they did the vote on, on the Indian language in the education, it was like 89, uh, uh, 89 votes in favor. Uh, and, and, and there were about 10 missing. There was, I think, only one vote against it, as I recall. So uh, clearly, uh, everyone said, we should do something about this. But it ended up in education, but they, there was an effort to figure out where do we put the language about uh, giving Indians a role in our government? Where do we put that? And uh, uh, the first appeals went to the Bill of Rights Committee. Can there be something in the Bill, uh, in the bill of Rights? And uh, that was where the two young ladies, the uh, two young girls mm -hmm. came forward uh, and testified. Uh, uh, you, do you remember the circumstance there? Uh, uh, well, if I, you know, what I understand it to be is that when, you know, there wasn't, there, no one was sure where to go. So indigenous people got moved from here to there and, you know, where does it really fit? Which is really an intriguing idea, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. we had to fit into some category yeah. before it could be um, inserted. And, you know, I'm really careful in the language that I use because I don't, I don't think that they gave us power. I don't think they gave indigenous people power. I, I think we took it. We took the opportunity 
and in, in a place where we really were standing outside looking in. Mm -hmm. And that continues today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it continues with the history of how Indian Ed for All has been um, used in this, in this state. And so, yeah, it ended up being put into education, but I have to say, when you invited me, Evan, to come and talk, I thought, oh, how are we going to expand that to be so much bigger than what it mm -hmm. is? Because it really is the foundation in which Indian people have in this state overall, whether you're looking at health care or um, economic development, natural resources, we all feel the pride that our people got us in that constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. although sometimes it's restricted to education. Yeah, and it, and it, it became a, a, a placeholder, so to speak, for lack of where else is it going to be, but it seemed like for a while that uh, the, the Indian folks who were working on it seemed like we're being bounced from committee to committee to where maybe in some cases there was a feeling that maybe we're being bounced around to get nothing, right. mm -hmm. uh, which right. is understandable uh, given the history. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, I remember listening as a little young, you know, a high school girl to Earl Barlow in my home as he was talking with, you know, people like Bearhead Swaney and Joe McDonald and, you know, all of those people that played such an important part of our history, really thinking and strategizing about how they would make this work. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, I, I, I knew Earl as a young high school girl and looked up to him and, and think now about what a foundation he was able to lay yeah, for us. Yeah. Now, uh, the first place that the young girl showed up uh, was in the Bill of Rights Committee. And it, it, this is text is coming from these documents, which are the, uh, the transcriptions of what went on in, on the floor, and then the activity that came out of the, uh, out of the committees. And this was uh, testimonies was being given by uh, Diane, uh, is it Lupi, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Mavis Scott. They were both just kids. They were high school kids, from weren't Fort they? Fort Peck. Fort Peck. They came mm -hmm. from down from Fort Peck and to give testimony uh, on behalf of uh, putting uh, Indians into the Constitution. And then they talked about uh, education, but they talked about the culture and the heritage. And they said that uh, ethnic groups we should be encouraged to preserve and promote their various cultural heritages, thereby enriching the total quality of life within our democratic society. Pretty thoughtful words for high school kids, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 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 they did mention that uh, Montana needed to recognize the need for inclusion and implementation of culturally <coughs> sensitive curricula within the education system. Uh, and they talked about uh, uh, that they requested that the curricula shall be relevant and sensitive to native peoples residing in the state of Montana and concluded with these extraordinarily powerful words. We would like, very simply, our history, our culture, our identity. I said, well, those are a couple good high school kids, oh, I'm yeah. telling mm -hmm. you. And, and that, I, I know it rang true to the committee members, but they couldn't figure out how to put it in the Bill of Rights. Uh, and one of those committee members was Dorothy Eck, and she was on that committee. And she became a champion on the floor later because it didn't seem to be a place. And so they did it on the floor uh, uh, to, to make that happen. But uh, it isn't, though it focuses on education, there's a recognition in that language that Montana needs <coughs> to be respectful of the heritage and the culture and the history of Native Americans in this state, not just for education, but it's just part of our, the fabric of our society in Montana. Uh, so it's taken a while, now it took a while to get there. The Indian, uh, uh, the Indian Education for All concept came out of the language that was in the Constitution. And right off the bat, uh, there was an effort to outline a plan to do that. Mm -hmm. Tell us, uh, tell us about that. Sure, um, but to go back to a point Anna made, I think is really powerful about Indians sure. weren't like passive 
you know, characters in this. They are taking an active role. And I do think Indian Ed for All and the Constitution is a great example of democracy and progress. Yeah. But then American Indians and their allies using the legal and legislative process to have a seat at the table. And so I think that's that's the power of a tool, but it's it's been a collaborative effort. And I think the, the power of relationships and connections is... Uh, is a huge part of Indian Ed for All. It's well, and, and the importance, you're right, of being at the table. Mm -hmm. Or as if you follow uh, uh, musicals, if you follow Hamilton, the wonderful Hamilton, it's you gotta be in the room where it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, and I, I also believe that um, once the doors are open yeah. and people walk through them, it's not possible to shut them behind because people are already through there. Yeah. And so it was our ancestors, as Mike and I will speak to always, we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. Mm -hmm. And they broke down those doors. Those, those, those men and women mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. walked, you know, really helped us in the 70s and the 80s to be where we are today, the fact that Mike can be, you know, at OPI or Office of Public Instruction, and that I, you know, would have had the opportunities to do what I got to do with, mm -hmm. with um, the governor. Yeah. Yeah, like I brought uh, the Indian Culture Master Plan, and this was written in 1975 by a team of educators that, that came camera. together, and this is a little timeline to go along with it, but the name on here is Henrietta White Man. Uh -huh. And everybody in Indian country knows Henry, you know, she's a legend in, in, in Indian, Indian education, and she was one of the main leaders of this effort, like Anna's talking about. A lot <laughs> of people worked for a very long time, and and to make this a reality. Now that master plan was developed when? 1975. Three years after the convention. Yeah, there was a law passed right after that though called the Indian Studies Law in 1973 which required teachers to take uh, Indian uh, Native American Studies classes. Now that law eventually got made uh, permissive um, in a few legislative sessions later because uh, the university systems didn't have the capacity to uh, you know, deal with these incoming teachers that needed to take these classes. And there's a great uh, paper written called the, uh, the Indian Studies Law and Exercise and Fertility, <laughs> because that was the name of that law. And um, when it made, was made permissive, I think only one school left it in place, I think it was Browning, mm -hmm. that still required their teachers to uh, you know, take some NAS classes. But um, that, that's an interesting scenario in of itself. But uh, the Indian Studies Law and Exercise and Fertility is written by Connie Erickson. She was a legislative research an analyst and just looked at that law and what happened. And um, I think what is different now is uh, we've got more systems in place. We've got, you know, Indian Ed for All has been around for a while. Well, it looks like the intentions coming out of the convention was a good intention. Here's a master plan. Mm -hmm. Let us move forward. Here's some implementing legislation that happened in the 73, 74, 75 sessions, mm -hmm. including saying uh, you got to you got to learn about Indian uh, heritage to be able to 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 teach in the Indian country. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, it's not uncommon to see something like that that has some impetus behind it uh, languish over time, and then kind of dissipate in a way by taking away the requirement and making it optional. Mm -hmm. There are many other laws that have gone that route uh, and uh, it's never a pretty picture when that happens. Yeah. But, but now all of a sudden here we are in 1975, we have a master plan and yet the words Indian education for all did not end up in the statutes until 24 years later. 1999. But that, that could be you know, because I, you know, I was a student at U of M working for Henrietta, mm -hmm. a work-study student during that time. And the excitement that was there, like in the set 1977 and that about bringing in, in Indian people to come and teach, um, you know, classes uh, around what would teachers need to know. Um, and then it all just went away when it went from being um, required to being optional. Mm -hmm. And as Mike has said, you know, only one school continues, continued that. And so 
I mean, I really do think that it had to, so there had to be a different approach that ultimately was taken as a result of a lawsuit, right, Mike? Yeah, it was a school funding lawsuit, which was got us funding. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, though, Carol Juno was looking at some of these old efforts, you know, mm -hmm. You know, how do we reaffirm our constitutional language and our commitment to it? And that's when she, you know, was in the state legislature and then worked the, through the bill, you know, Indian Ed for All. Um, uh, now that happened uh, when she was a senator in, in, uh, in 99. A representative. Uh, was she a representative? She was a house, yeah, she was in the House of Representing, okay. representing the Blackfeet tribe, right. the Browning, that, that. Right, that, that district That over district, there. yeah. And, and so she, she, she got the bill passed, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I like how it was much a, money was in it. It was an unfunded mm -hmm. mandate. There was, unfunded no, there was no mandate. money. Yeah. It, was, it was like, you, you know, unfunded mandates are kind of like, are they really a mandate until yes. they're funded, you mm -hmm. know, till, uh, so uh, uh, it, it took until including a lawsuit, several lawsuits. The first lawsuit kind of provided some stimulus, and then when the adequacy of funding lawsuit, which was, by the way, addressing the requirement in the Constitution for a quality education for everybody, mm -hmm. that lawsuit was brought, mm -hmm. and it was resolved in 2004, just as Governor Schweitzer was going in. So in the 2005 session, uh, there was a budget item there were two budget items, but let's talk about the first sure. one, yeah, which is well, Indian Education yeah, for All. And, and so that lawsuit, the uh, Montana Indian Education Association filed an amicus brief <clears throat> to go along with that suit, and that became one of the strongest pieces of that school funding lawsuit. And the court said the state is defenseless <laughs> on implementing Article 10 of the Constitution, and uh, the state didn't offer any defense anyway because it was you know, unfunded. That, yeah. And uh, that was really powerful. And so the court said you must define a quality education and then fund that definition. And as a result of that, <clears throat> Indian Ed for All is now as part of our quality education. It's a definition. If you're providing a quality education anywhere in Montana schools, you're supposed to be implementing Indian Ed for All into your schools. And so when we were in that definition is when we got funded then. And um, the key to that is that it's not Indian, it's not let's teach Indian uh, education and Indian history and Indian culture to Indian schools, for it's everybody. for everybody. Yeah, all means all. And, yeah. uh, I think it's powerful though, it's not just good for non-natives, it's good for Blackfeet to learn about the sure. Crow, mm -hmm. it's good for Crow to learn about the Salish, it's good for Salish to learn about the Assiniboine, and so I think it, it goes across all you know boundaries of whatever, different groups, and to me that's really powerful. But having that funding in place was uh, when we could bring folks together to develop curriculum, to pay people to do professional development. Schools could bring in guest speakers. Um, right after we passed the legislation, Denise Juno was working at OPI as the Indian Ed Specialist. It was just the office of one. And brought together representatives from different tribes and says, what do we want all Montanans to know? And out of that discussion came this document called The Essential Understandings Regarding Montana Indians. And and uh, there are seven themes, but these themes you can weave into pretty much any curricular area, science, math, social studies, language arts. And so here are these content areas you need to teach about and these skills. Well, why not use Indian education for all content and context to teach those skills? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the power of it. We've weaved it into our state standards. It's in our definition of a quality education. And so there's all these pieces in place that weren't in place back in 1973 and 75, but folks were working on that, building that foundation to get it in there. And when funding came around, that's when we really could, we could take off and uh, start putting stuff together. You know, it's, uh, it's intriguing to think about what 15 or 20 words stuck into mm -hmm. a constitution, mm -hmm. how much they can mean mm -hmm. as time moves on. And, assuming they are implemented and sorted out and so on. Uh, just having those in there was a, a powerful impetus that you couldn't forget it. At some point someone said, hey, you know, that's still in there. Mm -hmm. We've got to do this. And uh, uh, you're finding that there's an, uh, things become an article of convenience otherwise. If you're inconvenient, we don't do them. If they're convenient, we do. But if they're compelled, 
by language in the Constitution, enforced by courts, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's the rule of law in America and Montana. Uh, something we uh, need to think about all the time these days. Now, in, in go ahead. So, uh, you know, I'd like to add that second piece yes. before um, we go too much further. Um, you know, um, Governor Schweitzer also recognized that he wanted the voice of Indian people all across the state. The, the, um, at that point, the seven federally recognized tribes, mm -hmm. and, then, um, yeah. and then in the next uh, legislative session, he included the little shell that was state recognized that is now the 574th federally recognized tribe in, in this country. So there are eight tribes federally recognized now. Um, but he wanted it to be in their voice. He understood how important it was that it wasn't outsiders telling the story, it wasn't OPI or the, uh, the Board of Regents, um, but it was the tribes themselves. And so he added to that, that, that uh, directive mandate uh, with funding uh, the history to be written by the tribes. So the seven tribes got funding to actually write their history, which is, you know, Mike has brought forward the Blackfeet, um, their history that was written, you know, with with that support that, that um, Governor Schweitzer did. All seven of the tribes have that. We were re reminiscing about the one in uh, the Fort Peck one is literally this big, mm -hmm. um, really driven by um, the, their former chairman and histori Caleb, historian Caleb Shields. Um, so the tribes took great, uh, the tribal colleges took great pride in writing their own history, which then can be translated you know, across the state and can be used by OPI mm -hmm. as they're developing these um, you know, these lessons and curricula and, and, and used by teachers all across mm -hmm. the states. Yeah, the, the teacher in me can't resist visual aids. Yeah. And so those tribal histories that Anna's talking about, we worked with Julie Kajun to put a teacher's guide together to teach those tribal histories in, oh. to share that perspective. And so here's the, the content, here are some instructional strategies and resources to share that Blackfeet perspective or the Salish perspective or that Crow's perspective. And so really to you know, put the materials together to, to get that voice out there. I think has has been a fun part of my job. Um, is to, you know. Well, it just doesn't happen by magic. Mm -mm. There's got to be a lot of building blocks mm -hmm. in place to have this be functional and, and really work well. Yeah. And so, obviously, your office has been doing this uh, full bore since it got serious with money. Yeah. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, and and I do recall when uh, Governor Schweitzer was, uh, uh, would. Uh, uh, said we're going to do this thing, and every tribe, and, and I'm sure most people know, but probably not everyone, that each tribe in Montana has a tribal college, mm -hmm. and the tribal colleges were vested with the responsibility of bringing forth the history and uh, of, of of their tribe, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a, a task of took a lot of creativity at the local level, a lot of research, a lot of knowledge, a little bit of enforcement, a little bit of, hey, keep moving it forward because it was not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But to move from the or complete oral tradition to uh, written tribal histories, it can become uh, something that can be used forever. Uh, that was a major step. And, and uh, I would add to that that, you know, tribes had been on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. Even though this uh, language appeared in 1972, and so a big part of what had to happen after the the uh, Indian Ed for All was funded and the Tribal Histories was funding funded that the tribes there had to be a building of a relationship between the state and the tribes. You know the tribes did had had been left out. And now, I'll, you know, now they were being included in a meaningful way. And now, you know, believing that is hard, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, there was these um, starts and stops and grants and, you know, different things. And so it really took an ongoing building of a relationship 
um, that began, you know, with the funding of this. Um, certainly Carol and Denise Juno, uh, J Denise becoming the superintendent of public instruction gave a lot of credibility and ability to, for, uh, for the tribes to, to, to think that this is gonna happen because for the first time in really, I, I think it's the history of the United States, and an, an indigenous woman had been elected to a statewide right. office mm -hmm. as, um, as the um, superintendent of public instruction. So it was a great time of inclusion, inclusion on many <laughs> different levels. So not only in education, but as you have said, both of you have said, it was a time when um, we used that, those words from the Constitution to be inclusive in other areas as well. A time when, you know, Governor Schweitzer appointed more American Indians to boards and commissions um, than all other governors combined. You know, it was during those eight years. And, and so there were, there were um, people sitting at tables, um, not just one, not just two, but this number Lots. of people that could build on each other and work with each other because it was a priority of leadership. And as we know, leadership is so important. It's so important um, to, to really um, find your place and to feel comfortable and invited and and then your willingness to engage. Yeah, and a symbolic way Governor Schweitzer did that was just putting up the tribal flags in the governor's conference. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a big deal. And um, that had never happened before. And then even at his inauguration, he had our drum group, the MSU Bobcat Singers, come and open it up. And so our drum group on his inauguration brought the governor and his delegation in at the Civic Center in the ballroom. And so that was cool. And then he sat down and sang with us too. Yeah. And he actually kept a good beat. We were joking. <laughs> around with them afterwards. But um, having and those... Was, and it was the second meeting he had as governor. I mean, he in his reception area, there was an inter some international um, meeting that he took, and then those flags were all presented to him mm. at that day. And then he figured out a way to have them in that reception area every day of his administration. Yeah, and then a, a couple of legislative sessions ago now, Representative Marvin Weatherwax from Browning initiated a bill to have the tribal flags monument in front of the, the capital of the building right. itself. And so to have those flags flying up there from the eight tribal governments to me is it's just powerful. Yeah, it's it, really it cool just, to see. It is amazing that it was a major step forward to have the to be in that historical governor's reception room with those wooden mm -hmm. panels and the same mm -hmm. table that was there for a hundred years mm -hmm. and, and we would have meetings around there and in front of the gigantic fireplace is all the tribal flags yeah and that was uh, they just were there they're omnipresent a recognition and then I'll tell you, when you drive up in front of the Capitol now and you see that replicated outside on all those flagpoles behind Thomas Francis Marr, his statue is a circuit. There you have, there you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, what an amazing amount of progress that represents and how inspiring that is. It must be inspiring to Indian country. I will tell you, as a, as a, just a, uh, non-native Montanan, I'm telling you, I, I, it blows my socks off when I when I see yeah. that. When that wind starts going, and those flags are going. It's like, you know, it, we're speaking to our heritage and our recognition of our common humanity too, uh, which is important. Now, Governor Schweitzer, as I, in my recollection, he he uh, uh, at the inaugural itself, there was a. Uh, uh, he said, I want to have a drum group, native drum group, uh, play the drums and sing at the inauguration itself in the rotunda. And the Department of Administration came forward and said, uh, you can't do that. Well, why not? Because the vibrations from the drums could damage the windows oh, or something yeah. or some <laughs> crazy thing. And he says, well, you're just going to have to deal with damaged windows because we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so this opening of the doors of the Capitol is symbolic, but very meaningful. And uh, but it takes leadership uh, to keep those doors open. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the native population of Montana 
wants to become in those doors and through those doors and have been now. But uh, uh, just like those number of years that went from the setting up that master plan, you know, all of a sudden you had to have 24 years before you had it mentioned in the statutes mm -hmm. and 33 years before it was, or 20, let's see, what were my numbers there? Uh, it was uh, 19, 2004, yeah, so it was 32, 33 years before it was actually uh, financed, funded. That, that passage of time is emblematic of how things can kind of ease up and things aren't happening. Mm -hmm. So you guys are really in that agency right now in OPI in your program. Uh, you're protecting the future uh, by having these programs. And it's hard, right now it'd be pretty hard to get rid of Indian oh, yeah. education it for would all. Be, you know, Indian Ed for All is a great example of you know a bipartisan effort too. We're signed in the law by Republican Governor Mark Roscoe. Um, you know, and I think that during the funding, it's like it was, you know, a, a good bipartisan initiative. And I don't think, uh, I think that's the power of it too. Um, you know, the folks leading the charge are from across the aisle. And I think it's just good for all Montanans. But, you know, we have it in our state standards now, uh, K through 12. Um, and so I think in having a curriculum in place, having those tribal history projects in place, every tribe has tribal education directors that we work with. Uh, one of the starts that started in 1984 was the Board of Public, uh, Board of Public Education established a group called Macy, the Montana Advisory Council on Indian Education, and that's how OPI works with tribes on a government-to-government uh, relationship. Every tribe designates an official person to that board that advises OPI and the Board of Public Ed on these issues. And so, say when we're doing a curriculum, like the essential understandings, we run it by our Macy group, that they can take it back to their tribal council to say, hey, do you guys agree with this? Or can we uh, suggest OPI to go a different way? So we really try and take into account and really you know, honor that voice, that perspective. And if they're saying, no, we don't want that shared, we don't then. Mm -hmm. And so it um, varies from tribe to tribe, but we really try and uh, work on that government to government relationship through our, through our Macy. Well, the, ed the education component uh, certainly fuels uh, a responsible future. It sets things up for that, but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And I know, I, you know, in, in, in doing this whole series on the Montana Constitution, one of the things uh, we recognize is that uh, there was an enlightened document created that opened all kinds of doors and provided all kinds of. Uh, opportunities and protections for the citizens of Montana. All citizens of Montana are the most protected citizens in the United States. There are 17 specific protections we have in our Constitution that are not in the United States Constitution. Uh, there are uh, uh, the, the openness of government that's in there and all these things that are there in our Constitution, very enlightened and very uh, uh, recognized worldwide. Uh, but uh, for the entire 50 years that, uh, for the entire 50 years since the Constitution was created, there have been people wanting to claw back from that. They wanted to go back to, we don't want openness so much. We don't want privacy so much. We don't want this governmental structure so much. We don't like the judiciary quite the way it operates now. And maybe we don't want Indians at the table. <laughs> and maybe we don't want Indians at the table. See, that's a natural thing. So while we've evolved to this point, there's a devolution possible. Because there are people that want to claw back and be like we were under the 1889 Constitution. Well, so I think it's really important, Evan, to as you know that, that we really think about you know all the work that needs to be done in the state of Montana when it comes to its indigenous people you mm -hmm. know we um, you know we we have the highest rates of of um, you know suicide and substance abuse uh, I am really focusing right now on the impact that COVID has had on American Indians 
you know, very disproportionately impacted. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we, you know, we, during that first year, we were 19% yeah. of, the, of the cases and 32% of the death. Um, and we're not even 8% of the population. Right. And, and while those numbers may have gone down a little bit, as um, it is still the, the impact is felt today. Um, you know, uh, I, I think about, you know, about the work that Mike does, and yet I know that, you know, in American Indians between the ages of 65 and older were very disproportionately died from this, dis from COVID. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to figure out ways to take what that Constitution said about the integrity, about, you know, wanting us, us to be a part of who we are uh, in Montana, <laughs> because Montana is stronger when all of us are together. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that, and so it, it can't just be that we have this excellent, wonderful work that has been done in OPI. One of the things that, that I know um, the Governor Schweitzer talks about is that Indian Ed for All was probably the most important thing that he did in his administration because it impacts the generations to come. <clears throat> and as this generation now that has had the opportunity to see the flags flying for 20 years, right? They've seen them flying. They've had this in their cl classrooms. What are we going to do to make sure that indigenous people are at every table <clears throat> in Montana? You know, where, where, what are we going to do to make sure that there is equity in health care? Um, you know, that we're not overrepresented in the correction systems. You know, all of those, 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 those um, services that government provides. You know, how do we, how do we in, engage in equity and involvement and inclusion for Indian people? I believe we do it with the foundation of this Constitution. You know, what did our, what did the people say 50 years ago? They said they wanted us to be at the table. They wanted us to be there to make decisions, and they wanted the full inclusion of Montana's population, including the, the Indian people. You know, it's, it's absolutely true, and I, uh, one way to think about it is that the language that's in the Constitution which opens all these doors and all these possibilities, is is not. Uh, it's it's the floor. It's not the ceiling. Yeah, it's, it's the, the floor from which we can go upward. Mm -hmm. It's not a ceiling that constrains us. <laughs> yeah. It's not limited. It's a really open situation, and. Uh, in, in the economic development, when I was running the economic development office for Governor Schweitzer, uh, we had to deal, we would dealt directly with every tribe and the tribes together in terms of how do we create economic growth in Indian country because you, it's a, just a reality, just like with the COVID, uh, the, the, uh, the so many deaths and so many cases beyond the, the, the proper, the routine number that it should be is evidence, but the economics in Indian country, likewise, the jobs, we may have 3% unemployment in Montana and say, boy, our numbers are really good, but what are they around each, in, within yeah. and around each reservation? And in our urban populations. Yeah. You know, right. we now know that in this census, there are more urban Indians right. than reservation-based Indians. And so it's really important that we expand that, you know, to, to major areas of, of Haver and Hardin mm. and Cutbank and... Helena. Helena, you know, <laughs> all of the, you know, that, that really what, what, what are we doing to make sure that there are indigenous people represented in all of our governments, on our school boards, you know, in our city, county commissioners, um, in, in urban areas because that, that place at the table was set by this Constitution. Yeah, and then all those issues Anna was talking about, the social, the health, everything, you know, that's it's taken a lot to get that to where it's been too, you know, like when you think about education, 
you know, originally it was used as a weapon of mass destruction against Native people, the boarding school, kill the Indian, save the oh, man. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we're starting to come full circle because I've seen really cool programs that are based around culture and language, like on the Flathead Reservation, they have Nakusum, Language Immersion School. At Fort Belknap, they have a Language Immersion School. Up in Browning, they do. The state of Montana actually gives money to school districts to fund language programs now. And so, to me, that is really powerful, but we, we still have a long ways to go given that, his, that history. But what I've seen are these really cool pockets of culture and language in different places and then the healing that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. And it's not wanting going back to, you know, live in teepees or do any of that. It's just to be able to, you know, practice, live your cultural traditions, beliefs that have been there for tens of thousands of years and doing that in a modern way. And like, you know, the state gave tribes money to develop uh, language programs. And so a lot of tribes have language apps now and stuff for your phones. And, and to me, that's, you know, just using technology and, you know, resources around us to help maintain and revitalize and promote. Because I still want, you know, 500 years from now, I want folks still speaking Salish or Dakota or still doing ceremony uh, within this modern context. Because if not, we won't be there. Exactly. You know, it, it, it isn't about wanting to to go back. It's about knowing that culture and 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 groups of people change and evolve, <clears throat> and and that it's only then that that we will ensure that this goes into the future. I um, I I am you know someone that has spent a great amount of time working in healthcare. And I know that when we can use, when people understand who they are, who their core is, that they, they will go forward in a good way. Um, you know, there are words in, in um, each of our languages that are only spoken in our languages and concepts that are only <laughs> understood in our languages. And so it's so important that we tell our kids in the curriculum that this is who you are. You don't have to become someone else. You know, sometimes I hear people say, I walk in two worlds, you know, the indigenous world and the, and the non-indigenous world, and I don't, I don't agree with that. I walk in one world, and there isn't a time, and I'm sure you're, you'll attest to this, Evan, that there were times when we were in those early morning meetings at the governor, in the governor's office. We met every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m to talk about Indian issues during the mm -hmm. eight years of, of, uh, the governor, of Governor Schweitzer's terms, that you guys all wish that maybe Anna would miss the meeting, right? <laughs> that, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to think about, but pretty soon after in those eight years, I didn't have to be in the room. It became a part of who we all were. Mm -hmm. And it went forward because it was who we all were. <laughs> as a state, and that's when you know you've made a difference. So I, I just think that um, it's so important, mm -hmm. the inclusion mm -hmm. of people. Well, I'll tell you that I carry it forth with me to this day, that, and I didn't have that sensitivity <coughs> going into that mm -hmm. administration. I got his, but I do now. Now, I wanna, uh, we're getting close to the end, and I wanna, give a tip of the hat to a few names in the in the Constitutional Convention that uh, uh, names, well, 89 people voted in favor of the language when it went in. Uh, there were champions. Uh, Dorothy Eck had heard the testimony of the young girls in the Bill of Rights Committee and later brought that to the floor <coughs> and to the recognition of the floor. Uh, Chet Blaylock uh, out of Laurel, a school teacher from Laurel, uh, Chet became a champion. Earl Barlow speaks about how much help he got out of Chet for, for things. Uh, Rick Champeau, who was a history teacher mm -hmm. at Flathead Valley Community College, but chairman of the Education Committee, mm -hmm. he made sure, working with Bruce Severs, who was the research analyst of that committee, uh, Earl talks about how Bruce say, went and found him and said, you've got to come and sit on the floor when this is being discussed. And then they allowed Earl to go to the front and to speak to the convention. And uh, Earl said when he found, finished, he was so fearful of what he was saying might offend people or whatever, but he went for, he said the thunderous 
ovation <coughs> was unbelievable. He could not believe this. They, they wouldn't quit standing ovation. Uh, uh, Gene Harbaugh, a, popular, a pastor mm -hmm. from Poplar up there on the reservation there, played a big role. So I want to make sure we have a tip of the hat of those folks as time is running out on us here. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a number of champions. We appreciate your coming and sharing your perspectives with us on this very, very important issue. And for our viewers, we look forward to seeing you in the next show.